This is Chris Roberts with MTBS TV at CES 2015. I'm here with Nate Mitchell, VP of Product at Oculus. How are you doing? I'm really good. Thanks for joining us. Um, I just got the demo of the Crescent Bay, um, and I'm sure you've been hearing this a lot at the show, but it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm not new. I mean, I I think it was was it possibly 2011 when I first met you and Palmer at Pepcom before CES, and then you had like a, sh a, sh a suite in the Venetian. Not 2011, but 2013 it would have been. The 2013 was our first year at CES. Okay. Um, at the Venetian. Right. Anyway. We had kind of we had hit out in our uh, stolen CES suite. CES staff was not not very happy with us, but we uh, we made it work. Right, and that was a pre DK one yep. prototype kind of thing, yep. and you guys showed me Tuscany, and it was awesome, and I sort of had that. Okay, this is this is really cool. This is way better than other head-mounted displays I'd ever seen. Um, this blows that out of the water just immeasurably. Um, and you. well, I guess I, the last time I tried something was at um, E3 this year, mm -hmm. um, and did the Lucky or Lucky's Tale. Lucky's Tale, yep. and that was good. Um, but I, I I don't know. I don't know if it's the combination of the audio along with you know improvements in the rest of the system as far as the tracking and stuff, but. Um, when I was looking around in the San Francisco future cityscape and I looked down and realized I was the edge of the precipice, um, it was, I mean, the sense of vertigo, that sense of, you know, real fear is yeah. uh, pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, the Crescent Bay really does demonstrate, I think, how far we've come in terms of both presence and comfort. And really, that's been you know, the two main goals for us, right, is deliver this incredibly powerful experience that teleports you somewhere else and where you feel present in that space. And then also nailing the comfort side where you, you, know, you take it off and you're like, well, I feel great, put me back in. Um, you know, there's been a lot of changes since from DK2 to Crescent Bay, if you, you know, the headset itself is pretty much entirely revamped. New display technology, new optics, um, new ergonomics, back of the head tracking. I mean, we've been hard at work on improving the whole system and really pushing it to that consumer level. Um, we're not quite there, but I definitely think we've crossed that threshold where you, when you, when you try Crescent Bay, you really get you know, it's not it's not that glimpse or taste of of VR magic that you get from DK1 or DK2. You drop in there and you're like, oh my god, I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. Um, and that's something really special. Absolutely, and I think you know, for me, the difference between what I'd seen at, at E3 and and this, you know, really was that sense of comfort. As far as halfway through the demos, I really wasn't even paying attention anymore. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, obviously you guys have done a lot of improvements. Um, and I, for me personally, I've always been a little skeptical of uh, headphone three-dimensional audio. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of under so. I, I understand, you know, how algorithmically you can do that and have you know, the perceptive um, qualities and stuff. And I've heard a few demos and stuff, but this was really, really good. Um, is there, um, I guess one of the things that I had a question about, one of the emphasis, especially at GDC, has always been that DK2 is the last developer kit. Yep. And when the consumers get that version, that'll be our new thing. Do we get access as far as headphones and you know from the developers to be able to work with the DK2 and the positional audio? That's a great question. The The short version is no, but... <laughs> but um, The consumers get to have the first taste. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, it's a great point. I think we... We have to sort that out a bit. I think the positional audio you'll be able to use with any headphones. It's really not dependent on the drivers that we're using. That said, you know, one of the beauties of integrated audio is that developers and audio engineers know exactly what drivers, in theory, assuming you don't use your own headphones, um, what drivers the player is going to be listening to the audio back on. And that's something that, you know, is so rare and really, really powerful in terms of designing your audio experience. Um, so. How do we get developers those headphones? Well, if does it really work well with any? It really, does, okay. yeah, it really does. In fact, to be totally honest, putting on a nicer pair of headphones really even amplifies the experience that much more. Okay. The magic is really in the audio SDK. Okay. Yeah, and we'll be talking more about the audio SDK later this year. Um, I'm not an audio engineer myself. We have a killer SWAT team on the audio SDK. You, you Brian Hook, Peter Sterling. Um, Peter Giocaris, a few others, and they're making a lot of progress, and we've made a lot of headway, both you know in licensing the Visasonics deal and some other technology that we've put together. Okay. Um, and it really is you know a software thing. Now it still takes a great audio designer and engineer to make that happen. You know, Tom Smerden, who's the audio director on uh, the Crescent Bay demos, you know painstakingly went through and made sure they were phenomenal. But um, you you see how powerful the experience is when you get great spatialized audio. It really does amplify that sense of presence. Right. 
Um, and it seems like one of the other elements, we've got the visuals are really much better. We're getting there. Yeah. Um, and I guess that was one question I did have. When the Facebook acquisition happened, there was some talk about now that you guys would have better access and funding and stuff to pursue mm -hmm. you know, displays and stuff that were made for you rather than using off-the-shelf components. Is that, are we beginning to see the results of that or is there stuff you can talk about? I can say that there's not much that we can talk about. Okay. All I can say, and I'll let you guys you know, take away whatever you want. The display technology that we're using in Crescent Bay is 90 hertz, um, low persistence, which is really important to delivering that s level of presence, comfort, visual stability. That, and that it, it is OLED, is that? It is AMOLED, because you can really only do low persistence on AMOLED. Right, because you can do it on an LCD display. And that's something actually Palmer and had experimented with a long time ago. I remember um, Michael Abrash talking about really the difference between, and the trade-offs between high pers low persistence and frame rate and, you know. Right, so like you, what you really need is that pixel switching time to be incredibly low, because without that you're still going to get some residual motion blur and shutter exactly um, anyway so that technology that we're using there I think it's also partially the optics right because when you have a display you know, if you're if you explore head mounted display technology like many of the people who are probably watching this interview do <laughs> um, you know your audience it really is the combination between uh, the optics and the optimizations that we're choosing there because optics really is a game of compromises I didn't know that when we started the company I've learned it um, you know in terms of clarity and 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 distortion and everything else but it, and weight and everything else so when you you know when we talk about optics it's really pairing the optics with the display tech that we're choosing I think we've done a really nice job on Crescent Bay of, of creating really good complements to each other where actually the perceived resolution is actually slightly higher than than it than the actual resolution. Yeah, I mean, early in the demo, I was sort of focusing and trying to force myself to, you know, can I see the artifacts? Is there is there judder still? Is there stuff like that? And you know, I have to say, I was really impressed. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we we have an incredible team working on this stuff around the clock, so we're getting better. Again, not quite there, but we're getting there. Okay, so the visuals are looking really good. Thank you. Um, the audio. I think is does add a lot to it, and most of the other demos and stuff that I've seen, you know, people are always sort of putting the headphones on you, and you know, that's yes. part of it. So having that as an integrated part of the solution seems yep. like it makes sense. And, and just to be clear, like I said before, we do want people to be able to pop off our audio if they don't like it for whatever reason and plug in their own headphones. Okay. Well, that's good to know because I wasn't sure from the hardware perspective whether there's something special in you know the headphones themselves or whether it's just no, yeah, not not right now. And that, I think that's really important. I think. Even at Oculus, we have so many audio files, or potentially, which I, I call them. I need, I need to plug in my, my uh, solid day amplifier. So. <laughs> exactly. I mean, Palmer, Narav, even me and Palmer and Narav both laugh at my audio taste, but we all have different, you know, headphone selections. Well, and that was another follow up question I had was whether, I mean, a lot of people these days, especially for multiplayer, having, you know, a mic is absolutely required. Exactly. And, yeah. To be <laughs> honest, and, and Palmer will kill me that I say this, but I use Astra A40s at home just because when I am playing on my computer, generally I have my mic, you know, I'm on. Skype or something like that. So, you know, I'll probably use the Rift with some Astro A40s, and Palmer will be sorely disappointed in me. But, uh, but yeah, we want it to be uh, the audio solution to be able to be removable. You know, ultimately, we can't package a you know hundred dollar audio, really, really, really high quality audio product in there because it would amp ramp up the cost right. exactly. So what we've done is we've we, at least with Crescent A, we've chosen an audio driver that we think is extremely high quality at an affordable price point. It still increases the price of the product, but we think it's the right balance, you know, the right game of compromises to, to play there. Okay. Um, from the developer perspective, as far as going from DK to jump into comp yeah. consumer unit, is there anything else we might expect as far as uh, surprises that you could, I mean, the other piece obviously that's still out there is input. That's what I was about to say. I mean, you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. Uh, overall, I don't think there's too many other big surprises, but input really is the big outstanding piece. And, and you know, here at CES, we're not still not talking too much more about input. Uh, you know, people keep bringing up, we've made a few acquisitions recently. Yeah, I, I was really excited when I saw the Kickstarter and stuff for Nimble uh, VR. The, yeah, that looks great we were too oh uh, no <laughs> apparently <laughs> no in all seriousness we're thrilled to have uh nimble vr and 13th lab come on board they've sort of split up uh between product and research we, we sort of talk about research oculus research and product engineering so we're you know we're exploring input on a lot of different fronts and verticals and we don't have anything to announce as always yet yeah. but um you know, an input solution we think is a key part of delivering CV1. We just want you to be able to take it home, unbox it, and not, oh, oh God, I forgot to buy my Xbox gamepad at the store, or something like that. Um, you know, that, that doesn't mean that people aren't gonna build game uh, keyboard and mouse device, or 
keyboard and mouse games or HOTAS games or steering wheel games. People are going to bring all sorts of stuff. And frankly, I think game pads, you can have a great experience on a game pad even today. I think like Valkyrie and, you know, has already proven that. So, um, and a number of games out there, but we want to have a solution that comes in the box and we are working hard on that. Okay. Um, one of the cool things that I thought was really exciting about the DK2 was having the USB integrated right in the... Yes. So have there been anything, um, you know, the developers have done that you guys were sort of shocked or surprised or that, that's, you know, caught your attention? Yes and no. <laughs> yes, there is some stuff not that I really want to highlight um, for a bunch of different reasons. And then... Um, yeah, that's basically the long and short of it. People are doing really cool stuff. I mean, that's why we put the USB port on there was so that hackers and makers could experiment. Um, I think we've seen some cool stuff out there. You know, I, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things that's really been interesting to me as far as seeing the other stuff that people are doing um, is the non-game applications. Right. Um, and, you know, there almost seems like that's becoming a, a majority of demos and stuff that are popping up or, you know. Yeah, and, you know, my first experience with the, um, the Gear VR was the, you know, theater and you know, movies and stuff like that where I was... When I heard about it, I thought, okay, yeah, that, that might be cool it, it, you, for people who aren't that interested. I thought it might have an attraction, you know, to bring people. But seeing it and actually experiencing it, I thought, you know, that could be a use case all by itself, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a bunch we could talk about here. I think we're already seeing on Gear VR you know, if you look at the applications that are in the Oculus VR store today, there's a bunch of really neat stuff. And again, this is all free applications along with Innovator Edition. Um, but there's a bunch of neat stuff, whether it's gaming stuff or 360 video or even just panoramic photos. You know, like going to Easter Island through a panoramic photo is still compelling. And actually, that's something, you know, Carmack has said since the beginning is he's always been a big proponent internally of panoramic photos and videos just being one of the killer apps for, for VR. Right. I'm much more of the the purest camp of like, you know, more of the experience like you saw with Crescent Bay where you have a real-time graphic scene happening sort of around you. I, I'm a b big believer in presence. But they're both... You know, that's uh, to your point. The cool thing about VR is we're still learning like what's compelling, what's not, and it really is blue sky. Um, and so to see all these people trying all these different things is, I think, the best part. And that's you know why we released DK2 publicly and Innovator Edition. Why we you're shipping that now is it is pretty cool to be a, you know on the cutting edge of this with the developers and giving them feedback and helping shape you know the VR that we're going to see over the next two, three, four, five years. Um, back to the Gear VR for a second. Yeah. I was actually really sort of shocked when I heard the announcement because it was like, well, there's been all this emphasis on super low latency yes. and crushing processor requirements. Yes. And, you know, the whole thing about, you know, presence absolutely requires you to be, you know, and then it's like, okay, the first product to market is a uh, mobile. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's something where... Uh Again, I, I, it's easy to speak from my personal experience, but I was very skeptical that we could deliver a great VR experience on the mobile device. And John, to, you know, to his credit, was was adamant that we absolutely could. And you know, he quickly pulled together some prototypes even before really digging in with Samsung and without you know engaging with them for the modifications that we needed to make sort of under the hood, and demonstrated like. This was good. I remember lying on my couch in my room using a 3D printed mock-up really, really early on that John had made of Gear VR, basically, um, watching a, a video. I won't say which one since I'd ripped it off Blu-ray, but uh, a, a video and being like, this is going to work. This is going to be a compelling experience. And, uh, you know, pretty quickly after that, we, we pulled together a separate software team sort of to really dive in and nail that. And, you know, that team is just incredible. And the work that they've done is pretty astounding. And I think you don't know just how good Gear VR is and uh, the Innovator Edition, at least, until you put it on and try it. Um, it's pretty shockingly good and uh, huge shout out to the to the oculus mobile team for making it happen awesome um so i guess if imitation is the sincerest form of flattery you guys deserve a pat on the back i mean <laughs> for, for going from a few years ago not even on the show floor having prototypes to show and stuff like that to i mean if you walk around today it was interesting to see that previous shows there's been lots of oculus mm -hmm. in other people's booths uh, yep. to demonstrate stuff this year there's been lots of other other VR, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's it's interesting to see what people are trying, what they're doing, and stuff. Um, but I think you guys do deserve a lot of congratulations for forging ahead and being, you know, something that is. It's a team effort. I mean, even just now, you know, we put out a blog post just earlier this week when when CES started, and 
it does feel, you know, people keep coming up to us and saying, like, wow, it's the year of, like, VR at CES. Um, sometimes in comparison to 3D TVs, which is not always the... Those are still big. I, <laughs> this, is, this is the right audience, right? Um, but, no, in all seriousness, I think that's only because of the community and the developers and everyone who's supported this thing, everyone who backed the Oculus Kickstarter. Thank you, guys. Like, pretty much everyone watching this video. Um, I mean, it's just awesome. And I think we could never have done this as, like we said early on, as a group of like four or five, six people. It would just would have been impossible. And it's awesome to see VR take off in, in such a big way. It's awesome to be a part of it. Um, now, if we want to talk about some of the other VR headsets, we, we can. Well, but there's been, okay, I guess my way of looking at it, going around the floor and seeing what people have, is there's, there are things that are super cool. Definitely. And, I, you know, I guess earlier to my question about, like, other stuff people might have plugged into USB, um, the thing that I guess impressed me the most this year, which I'd never seen satisfactorily before, is eye tracking. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's a, a, another guy who's got a, a headset that's got eye tracking, and it's... You know, from my perspective, I, I really am excited about that because for me, it's like I look around my world more by moving my eyes than moving my head. Um, you think that, but you actually move your head quite a bit. I do. That's um, not to diminish eye tracking at all. Right. I think so. Just on eye tracking in general. Um, Eye tracking is a tough one. I think eye tracking is something that is going to be valuable for VR and for a bunch of different ways. Ways first and foremost, like probably the lowest hanging fruit is just being able to look at each other. Um, you know, having a conversation in a space where it's not just our head tracking, but I can see if you're looking past me. And humans are incredibly sensitive, right? I know if you're looking at that door, you know, even if you're, it's a, a you know, a fraction of a degree, I know exactly where you're looking. Um, so really nailing that, and it's something that doesn't actually have to be low latency, right? That's why I say it's low hanging fruit, because it can be delayed, it doesn't matter. It still is a powerful feeling to actually know that you're looking at me, or ignoring me um so the challenges around eye tracking if we think that's the lowest hanging fruit are really cost weight um you know how integrated a system can we get in the headset there's obviously lighting constraints and things like that inside the rift but um i think eye tracking is something that's going to be a big thing f i personally think it's gonna be a big thing for the future of vr i can say it's something that we're not as excited about for cv1 just because the technology is not quite there um there's a lot of companies doing a lot of really cool stuff i think toby is one of the leaders that i've been watching for now two and a half years or something like that but it's a little early to be integrated into our product that said it is something we're investigating and exploring heavily and and in especially in terms when you look at like interaction paradigms, the, the stuff we're talking about, like how is social impacted, social VR impacted by eye tracking. I think that's when it gets really interesting. And of course, there's other theoretical enhancements like foveated rendering and things like that. Um, for foveated rendering, you need some very high performance eye tracking. We're still well, I saw a demonstration of that at SIGGRAPH recently yeah. where, you know, that specifically was for stereoscopic 3D. Um, and it was, you know, he had multiple 4K displays and it looked, I mean, it was a desktop based solution where it knew where you were looking and optimized the rendering there. Yeah. But I could imagine for, you know, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a big thing. I think we all agree on that. It, the question of, you know, how soon can we get it into the product at an affordable price where it really does amplify the experience. I think that's the jury's still out on that one. Hopefully it's sooner rather than later, but probably not for CV1. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. I'm really you know, excited about what I saw today. Um, honestly, I can't overemphasize how impressed. I mean, and it's not something that I've just seen for the first time. I've been along the ride. You, you know. have, <laughs> and we appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you guys. I think uh, you know the big thing for us is with Gear VR Innovator Edition now out there, and that's going to continue to improve, Crescent Bay, um, you know, showing that publicly for the first time. I think you know, the big message for us, at least at CES, is you're beginning to see consumer VR come to life. And, and sort of, even though we're not quite there on either vertical, mobile or PC, mm -hmm. you can see sort of where we're going. And that the, the consumer VR is not far away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is Chris Roberts with MTBS TV. Uh, with <laughs> Thanks a lot, Nate. My pleasure, man. Thank you. Okay. Take care.